Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and in this episode we're going down an avenue we've not been down before. Calculators. But not just any calculator, old calculators. Here's an example of a calculator which I'm guessing most people over the age of 16 are probably familiar with scientific calculators. It's what, certainly in England, we had to do uh, most of our GCSE maths, which for exams you do at about 16 years old. But of course, these weren't the only types of calculators about. You go back and you get the older style Add, subtract, multiply. I don't want to say this is an adding machine, but this is in that kind of realm. So now adding machines tend to be for accounts and have very limited functionality that serve a purpose really well. And then I've got the TI-30, which is a really early scientific calculator. So this Sharp ELSI-804 is from 1973 and the Texas Instruments TI-30. The name and the design originates from 1976. So these two are quite close in age, but I don't know exactly when this one was done, when this one was actually manufactured because they were kept these going for a very long time and actually kept the name even in modern ones. You can go and buy a TI-30 in some way, shape or form. Now, first of all, I have to give a shout out to DJ Harrigan. He has sent me these, they've come all the way from America as is painfully obvious by the 110 volt power for this one. So we'll have a bit of a play with this one, see if we can get some other power into it and see if we can get it working. Might be a good challenge. Shall we start with the Sharp? This is gonna be the oldest one, 1973. Let's get into it. So, inspected by RV and TN. I wonder who they are. Four watts. Four watts is quite a lot of draw for a calculator. I don't know what the average power draw is from my very modern example, but based on the fact that it's normally can be powered by a tiny little photo cell backed up by a battery, you would think that's got a very, very, very low power draw. Four watts is high. I have a sneaky suspicion I know why. I feel like membrane keys, probably. Ooh. Wow, individual vacuum tubes per digit. That's cool. I'm very interested by the wear pattern on the front of this. It's like somebody has regularly put a thumb in there. Do you reckon that's because they've wiped the dust out like that? Or do you think that's because they had a habit of putting their finger in while they were reading the screen off? And this glass on here. It's a weird green colour and I would guess that's just to up the contrast on the uh, these vacuum seven segment displays. Ooh, seven segment plus a decimal display. So eight segment displays really. Yeah, there's a weird green tinted glass. Like I say, I'm guessing that's to up the contrast. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Then soldered on but of course they are so we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven buttons on here and one two three four six seven eight nine ten eleven eleven terminals on there you wouldn't expect that would you Ooh, and two unused membrane buttons up here as well i wonder what functionality we're missing got this screened plate on the back. That grounding pin is riveted. Just trying to work out where it goes to. Oh, it's right there. Wonderfully laid out board. So obviously these connections are for the bottom of the vacuum tubes. So I think you can really clearly say that I see over here is going to be part of the driving circuitry for the displays. And then you've got Really working literally backwards here. Got all the traces that run this way, oh, they're paired up. So there were our 11 pins that ran the number pad, and there's the other keypad with our extra two buttons. But they're actually paralleled up, so you can see that the terminal there, if 
from the number pad also corresponds with the button. So these are going to be matrixed together. So I would make that 10 IO with a switched ground, I think. You can see big trace down here to that IC. Most of the IO goes to this IC over here. I've got some large pins there, one per digit. So it's probably multiplexing the outputs. So you switch fast through the vacuum displays and then you've got this IC telling which segment on each display to turn on at any one time. So if we follow the traces here, that post on every vacuum tube is attached to the same trace. So at the time that this one's on and that one's on, you're going to get that segment on the first display. Then you switch to this one and it'll either be on or off of the next display and so on and so forth. Oh, this one's actually socketed. I hadn't expected any socketed ICs in a calculator. But then again, I guess I've got the space to play with in this one. This Futaba one up here actually controlled the vacuum fluorescence. So that did the, the segment switching and that's a TM4356P. And we've got another Futaba over here and the other two are Hitachi? No. What's that little logo? That is Hitachi, isn't it? An HD3253P3C and an HD3276P. And I think this one was basically the brains. That's, that's actually the calculator. So this large I see at the bottom, these two rows of pins here, doing most of the work. You've got display and yeah, these two are managing the display with this, the uh, tube select and the segment select, those two there. So that's a neat little calculator. Not many functions. All of the actual thinking work is basically done by the single IC down here. The rest is all just to uh, multiplex the, uh, the inputs and the outputs and drive that vacuum fluorescent displays, which by the way are awesome. You know, it's only one step shy of Nixie tubes here, having those individual seven segment vacuum displays. Interesting that this metal plate has got an extra two holes and you've got these extra two membrane buttons here. So there was clearly another model based on the same hardware that had extra features. Those extra two terminals there. I wanted to pop this fuse out because it's shorted. There's a blob of solder on each end and a tiny bit of fuse wire. It's tough to know if that's an aftermarket change or whether that was the equivalent of a bodge wire. I would like to think that's aftermarket because I don't think any manufacturer would have gone to the length of putting fuse holders in just to bypass them. That would be absolutely crazy. That's still a multi-output transformer. These two this side come down that trace. Uh, of course, because you've still got the high voltage needed to run the vacuum display. It's okay. We won't give up faith just yet, but it's a good probability that we won't be able to get enough of the voltages required out of this transformer through other means. But let's put that to side, one side for a minute. So this scientific calculator is only a few years younger than this one. This still dates from the 70s, or the design does at the very least. Now it's not just the additional functions, the reciprocal, the square, the square root, and trigonometric functions, logs, uh, natural log. It's also the fact this has memory on it. And so this has a four slot memory, I think. You've got the store and recall um, functions. That was quite a big deal, which I think was all integrated into one chip for this. Doesn't necessarily mean that there's only a single chip in here, but there's only one right way to find out. Now you'll also notice this is all driven from a single nine volt battery, which makes it imminently more useful than the corded version we saw a few years earlier. And I think there is one particular feature that made that possible. Oh, do you know what? I had not noticed that hole in the side. I wonder if this had a barrel jack option. There you go. Well, I think we actually got that off without 
completely destroying anything. It's always a nice moment. Oh, look at all the foam, it's just deteriorating. That's a shame. I don't think I've got anything quite appropriate that I can replace that with straight off the bat. That might have to be a long-term sourcing activity. What is interesting though, is all these buttons are just loose bits of plastic. I don't really want to flip this over. It's going to end in tears for everybody involved. So all of these buttons are identical and they are just bits of plastic in the uh, in the front of that case. I think we got away with that with just the one falling out. What is interesting is how the construction of the actual calculator has changed so drastically. So we've now got a nine volt battery, which does all of the heavy lifting. All of the buttons are now tactile domes, which are level with you. Feel fantastic. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen traces. Four, one, two, three, four, five, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Forty buttons. So they are absolutely matrixed together. Like a dog cocking its leg, just ready to uh, use the facilities. I've noticed one pin on this sticks right up in the air. So there is actually a hole and a trace on the board for it, but for whatever reason, it never got used. Now, can you imagine that being your job in the factory in the 1970s? That you've got to get all of these tiny little ICs and just bend each leg out. Where in this you can particularly see the future has arrived is right here. This display, which is absolutely beautiful is seven segment LEDs or eight segment LEDs including the decimal point again and the fact that you've transitioned to vacuum fluorescence which need they are physically fragile they require high voltage to run they have poor contrast they have all these characteristics which make them very hard to manage versus these LEDs I mean look at the physical size difference between these vacuum displays and these LEDs. They're tiny and just crazy to be that different. And they've got this tiny little injection molded lens that sits over the front. That's just melted through. They've put the posts through the PCB and just melted them in. Okay, so let's just set the voltage down to nine volts. Double check. And then got it connected up okay. So let's fire it up. And that LED display is so wonderfully crystal clear and so low energy that it can run off a nine volt battery with no issues whatsoever. I hope this teardown gives you a really good visualization of how a seemingly uninteresting technology can make a very big difference to all aspects of a device. The vacuum fluorescent displays in here needed a lot of energy, four watts. They needed uh, high voltages, which meant separate driving circuitry. Step forward just three years to when you had an LED display and you had an integrated circuit that could do all of the functionality in here and more. This can do the input output multiplexing. This can do the uh, LED driving. There's no extra voltages required. It just makes such a difference to the length of length of time and portability that you can use this display and I have to say those red LEDs are still really cool they've got a really good look to them once again I'd like to thank DJ for sending these over to me really appreciate it if you've got an idea for a teardown that you'd like to see don't forget to let me know over at the element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside I hope you've enjoyed this one thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time